Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, today's presentation is presented by California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform in partnership with Betsetic, a legal services provider in Los Angeles County. Uh, we're gonna be talking today about the home and community-based services programs that are available through Medi-Cal. So we'll talk about uh, Medi-Cal covered programs that provide care and support in the home uh, and programs that help people transition from nursing homes to the community. Today, um, as part of our presenter panel, we have Kim Selfon from Betsetic. She's a Medi-Cal and IHSS policy specialist. We have Pauline Shatara, uh, Deputy Director for California Advocates. And myself, I'm Maura uh, Gibney. I'm the Director of Organizational Development for Canner. So I am going to start the presentation now. It would be helpful if I shared my screen, I bet. Could be. That's, that's usually helpful, right? Okay. Okay. All right, the slides look okay? Great, okay. Um, so first briefly, uh, Canner Services, uh, we're a statewide nonprofit organization. We work to improve the quality of uh, care in long-term care facilities. Um, we provide free consumer counseling regarding long-term care planning and options, Medi-Cal planning, eligibility, uh, Medi-Cal recovery, transfer discharge issues, um, residents' rights in long-term care facilities. We conduct community education like today's presentation. Um, on our website, canner.org, we also have a lot of free publications available for download uh, for um, consumers and families. We engage in policy and administrative advocacy as well as litigation to improve the long-term care landscape in California. For today's agenda, we'll be providing an overview of home and community-based services program, including an in-depth look at the in-home supportive services program, as well as various waiver programs. We'll talk about programs supporting transition to the community out of long-term care facilities. And we'll take a brief look at Medi-Cal recovery in relation to home and community-based services. So first we'll take a look at what are home and community-based services. Um, and many times you might hear the acronym HCBS. Um, that is something that's quite frequently used. These are programs that offer an alternative to placement in a nursing home for people that want to remain in the community or who are in a skilled nursing facility or hospital and want to return back to the community. Uh, services can include caregiving services. It can be help with chores, meal preparation, um, in-home nursing care, case management, and home modifications. Not all services are available in all counties, and we're going to be providing the details about that in each um, in-depth kind of look at the program, and you need to apply to each program individually. We're going to give you information about how you can apply for each program individually, um, including the links that you need to access these programs. And it's important to note that married couples or registered domestic partners can receive additional income and asset allowances if only one spouse is on Medi-Cal and becomes eligible for HCBS services, or even if they're just on a wait list for a home and community-based services program. So now I'll turn it over to Kim, who's going to walk us through the wild world of in-home support. <laughs> Thanks, Mara. Um, Hello, everyone. I want to talk about IHSS services today. Um, I usually give like an hour presentation on this and I've condensed it into about 20 minutes. So there's a lot more to know. We're going to give you some resources at the end that you can do reading and get some more information. Um, the I, California's in-home supportive services program came out of the disability rights movement in the 1970s. Uh, people with disabilities or severe disabilities often had to go to institutions to get care and they wanted to stay home. So this program came into being to allow people with disabilities to stay home, to stay out of an institution, get the care they need at home. Um, so this program does provide home care and support with household chores like cooking and cleaning, personal care services like helping uh, take a bath or getting dressed, 
paramedical services and uh, protective supervision, which is to watch someone who has a, a cognitive impairment and could be a danger if left alone. There's no age restriction for this program. So from birth to as old as you can be, you can be in in-home supportive services programs. Um, the hours are provided based on a needs assessment. So a social worker will come to the home, do an evaluation and give hours based on the regulations and that person's individual needs. So you can't really compare two individuals hours because everyone's needs are different and the needs are done on a personalized basis. Um, so this program operates statewide, wherever you live in the state of California, you can get in-home supportive services as long as you qualify for Medi-Cal and there's no waiting list for this program. This program allows you to choose your own worker. So in fact, that's the way the program was set up initially. So people had autonomy and choice on to, uh, as to who their worker is. So it can be a family member, it can be a friend, or it can be a private provider. About 80% of people in this program use family members as their providers. Uh, it can be hard to find a private provider right now because of just the shortage of workers, in-home supportive services pays the worker directly. So they will do an assessment in the home, tell the person how many hours they get, let's say 200 hours, and then IHSS pays the provider directly. Um, and the IHSS wages, they vary depending on the county. Each county negotiates hours for their workers, um, and they vary widely. In LA County right now, it's $16.50 an hour. That's uh, just above minimum, I think. Um, so it, it's often hard to find workers because the wages are quite low. So to qualify for IHSS, like we said, you have to be eligible for Medi-Cal. All of the programs we're gonna talk about today, you have to be eligible for Medi-Cal. So that's the first step is qualifying for Medi-Cal. Um, and then you would contact your county IHSS to apply for IHSS. So there's two separate applications, one for Medi-Cal, one for IHSS. I always tell people apply for both at the same time if they're gonna need Medi-Cal and IHSS because IHSS hours begin from the date of application. So if you wait until Medi-Cal is approved to apply for IHSS, you're going to lose maybe a month of time or 45 days of time while Medi-Cal is processing the application. So apply for both at the same time. IHSS will hold the application until Medi-Cal is approved, then evaluate you, and the hours will go retroactive to your date of application. So like I mentioned, what happens when you apply for IHSS is an IHSS eligibility worker will come to your home to evaluate your need for IHS hours. So an eligibility worker will assess you at the initial application, and then they evaluate you once a year to see if your situation or condition has changed. Now, anytime your condition changes, let's say um, I get IHSS, and I get 200 hours and then I'm hospitalized and I need more care, I can ask for more time. I can call my social worker and say, hey, my conditions changed, please reevaluate me. And they're supposed to do that. So the maximum hours that someone can get in the IHSS program is 283 hours a month. Okay, that's the maximum. Most people do not get 283 hours a month. Um, but that is the program limit. So no one can get more than 283 hours a month in this program, but we're gonna discuss other HCBS services, other programs that work with IHSS so they can get more time, people can get more time uh, combining IHSS with some of the other programs. Now IHSS can't be combined with all the other programs we're gonna talk about today, but we'll tell you which ones you can combine. So when IHSS does an assessment, I always talk to my clients um, and prepare them, let them know what questions IHSS is gonna ask. Cause they come into the home, the social worker or eligibility worker, and they ask all these very personal questions. And I know if some stranger comes into my home and starts asking me personal questions about, do I need help bathing? Do I need help toileting? Do I need help dressing? I may not really wanna be very honest with them about my needs. 
but this is the time to ensure that you let your needs know are known so that the social worker can give you the time you need. If you don't tell them you need help, they don't know you need help. If you just need help sometimes, let them know. Um, think about your worst days, and that's what you tell the social worker uh, your condition is, because the social workers are supposed to evaluate you based on your worst days and the time that you need most need. So think about that um, when you're preparing for the assessment. You can have a provider, your provider with you. You can have a family member or friend at the assessment. That sometimes helps. If you forget something, you can have your friend or your family member chime in and um, just work together to make sure your needs are met. In-home supportive services has a special benefit called protective supervision. Protective supervision is a benefit an IHSS benefit for people who have a cognitive impairment and need to be watched, they can't be left alone because of that cognitive impairment. So it could be any kind of cognitive impairment. It could be um, a developmental disability, Down syndrome, mental illness, schizophrenia, Alzheimer, dementia, anything, um, traumatic brain injury that causes a cognitive impairment where the person does things that are dangerous, but they don't know they're doing dangerous things because they can't understand because of the cognitive impairment. So typically we work a lot with people with Alzheimer's disease um, and they may try to leave their home, not realizing it's actually their home. They want to go home. They leave the house and they can't find their way back. That's very dangerous, they have to be watched. Or they try to cook and they leave the stove on and start fires, or they eat things that are inedible, or they inadvertently hurt themselves. I've had clients that you know, spray their skin with bleach to clean themselves, that kind of thing, because they don't know what they're doing that's dangerous, so they have to have somebody there with them all the time to watch them. It's called protective supervision. Um, if you're in that situation or your loved one or family member or friend is in that situation, be sure to ask for protective supervision. IHSS often denies protective supervision requests because people get a lot of hours when they get protective supervision. If someone gets protective supervision, they automatically get 195 hours or more a month. Or if they have a severe uh, disability according to IHSS criteria and they get protective supervision, they automatically get the maximum hours, which are 283 a month. So that really helps people who have cognitive impairments stay safely in their home. Um, it's sometimes hard to get, sometimes you have to file appeals to get it, but it's definitely a benefit that's available to people. So one way to prepare for your initial assessment or your annual assessment is to complete a self-assessment worksheet, and that's the next slide. We have a booklet um, that has this assessment worksheet, and we can send it out if we're going to send materials out afterwards to you. So IHSS will evaluate you in all these different categories. We Our assessment worksheet is pretty short to make it easy to complete. Disability rights has a very extensive one, so it just depends which one you want to complete. Um, so it lists the main categories uh, that you may need help with, and then you mark the level of help you need. IHSS determines your hours based on the level of help that you need in each service area. Um, so you can go ahead complete this worksheet for yourself or your family member before an assessment and give a copy to your social worker. Uh, and it also just reading through it, it, it enables you to see what kind of areas they're gonna be asking questions about and then think about what you need help with in those service areas. Next slide. So after IHSS evaluates you, they will send you something in the mail called the Notice of Action. This is a picture of my dog, Micah, and he's holding his Notice of Action. Um, it's a long sheet of paper, four pages long, and it outlines all the hours that IHSS has evaluated for you for in each subject area. So you can see, it's hard to see, I know this is tiny, but if you get help, um, like this woman gets help with bowel and bladder care, 
she gets three hours and 51 minutes a week. It tells you how much time you get in each service area. So if you look at your notice of action and you see, oh, for feeding, they gave me zero, but I need someone to feed me. I can't feed myself. You know there's a problem. And then you can ask for more time in the service areas. There's a whole appeal process. If you don't agree with the assessment, you can appeal the hours. You know, think about it like this, like, you know what your condition is, right? But the social worker is in your home for maybe 30 minutes, once a year. So they may not get all the information they need in order to give you the hours you need. And often you don't know what they're looking for when they come and they ask you all these questions. So it really helps to be prepared. Think about what areas of service you need, Look at the notice that they give you, see if they've given you enough hours. And if they haven't given you enough hours, uh, you have a couple options. Next slide. So there's a couple options to increase your IHSS hours. One is just call your social worker and say, hey, it's, it's not enough. I need more time in different service areas. Tell them exactly where you need the time and how much. See if they'll increase it. You can go up the chain of command and talk to a supervisor or deputy at your office if your social worker just refuses to increase it. Um, and also you can increase your IHSS hours with a hearing. So when IHSS evaluates you, they send you that notice of action in the mail and you have 90 days from the date on the notice of action to request a hearing, okay? So you have 90 days to request a hearing on any IHSS action or inaction. So if you call IHSS, you're already getting benefits. You call them and you say, hey, I need more time. I was in the hospital, I need more time. And they say, okay, and they don't do anything. That's an inaction, right? So you called, you asked for help, they didn't do anything. So you have 90 days from the request for help to ask for a hearing if they didn't do anything. So 90 days from any action or inaction. The most important thing to remember is if you get IHSS and your hours are reduced, the first thing you do is ask for a hearing before the reduction date and your benefits will stay the same. So for example, let's say I get 200 IHSS hours and now I get a reassessed, I get a letter in the mail saying as of April 1st, my IHSS hours will be reduced from 200 hours to 100 hours. That's a big difference, right? That's going to be really difficult for me to survive on 100 hours. So the first thing I do is I call state hearing and ask for a hearing. The number for state hearing is on page two on the notice. I ask for a hearing before April 1st, which is the date of the reduction. If I do that, my benefits will stay the same at 200 hours until the hearing, okay? Um, and then I just have to show I need continue to need 200 hours and hopefully I win at hearing. If I lose at hearing, um, there's no overpayment. I don't have to worry about paying those hours back. That's called aid paid pending. IHSS has to send you a notice 10 days before any reduction. So if you get mail from IHSS, or Medi-Cal, make sure you open it right away um, because you usually only have 10 days in order to ask for a hearing before a change in benefit. Many times, oh, back to the other slide, please. There you go. So a lot of times I ask for a hearing, but most of the time we don't go to hearing, okay? IHSS has another option called a conditional withdrawal. So when I ask for a hearing for a client, IHSS assigns an appeals specialist to the case who represents IHSS. But that appeals specialist is also supposed to follow the law. And the law says that they're, tr they're supposed to resolve things at the lowest level. So usually what we do is we, with we um, create a settlement. It's called a conditional withdrawal. So we make an agreement. Uh, IHSS agrees to do something Usually, it's to perform a reassessment. So usually, I agree with IHSS to perform a reassessment of my client um, instead of going to the hearing. 
So we withdraw from the hearing on the condition that IHSS reassesses my client. IHSS has 30 days to do the reassessment or whatever else they agreed to do. And once that reassessment's issued, if you still don't like the hours or the outcome, you can ask for a hearing again. So you get like two bites at the apple. You do a conditional withdrawal. Um, you don't have to go to the hearing. IHSS reassesses you. You're still not happy. Then you can ask for a hearing. Next slide. So the IHSS hearings are informal hearings. Right now they're held by phone or a video conference. You can have an in-person hearing if you want, um, but they'll be scheduled via phone or video conference unless you ask for an in-person hearing. They are informal. There's a judge there, an administrative law judge, who records the hearing. Um, the appeals worker who represents IHSS and the social worker attend the hearing. And the judge asks the appeals worker, the social worker, why they computed your hours the way they did. Why did they give you so many hours in cooking or cleaning or bathing? And then you explain why you need more time in each service area. And then the judge will issue a written decision within a certain time frame. So that's the way the process works. After the judge issues a decision, IHSS has 30 days to comply with the decision. So if you ask for a hearing, your hours could go up or they could go down. It just you know, depends on what the judge decides on the decision. So there's always risks in asking for a hearing, um, but most of the time using a conditional withdrawal process or the hearing process, we're usually able to increase hours. IHSS hearings are informal. Most people are not represented. Judges are used to people going in on their own. That's where they're trained to do is work with people on their own without representation. So there's no need to feel like you can't do it on your own. Next slide. I wanted to talk about the Medi-Cal share of cost in IHSS. Um, Medi-Cal has different programs. They have a program called the share of cost program. If someone gets stuck in this program, um, it's pretty expensive to access Medi-Cal. And I just wanna explain the way it works. There are some options um, to meet or get rid of share of cost. Uh, if someone has a share of cost, IHSS often discourages that person from proceeding with an IHSS application, um, but you can still get IHSS with a share of cost. So here's an example. Jill's monthly share of cost is $1,200 a month. A share of cost is like a monthly deductible, okay? So she has to pay the first $1,200 of medical services each month, and that includes in-home supportive services. So let's say Jill gets 200 hours a month of IHSS. If her provider's in LA County, the 200 times $16.50 an hour equals $3,300 a month. So her provider will be paid $3,300 a month for the IHSS services to Jill. Well, Jill will owe her provider her share of costs each month. So Jill owes the provider $1,200 each month, and then IHSS will pay the remaining $2,100 to the provider. share of cost. You don't have to prove to IHS that you paid the share of cost. Um, you can pay the share of cost, like Jill could pay the 1200 directly to her provider and meet the share of cost, but it's very expensive. Jill may not have enough money to live if she does that. Um, the second option is let's say Jill's provider is her daughter and her daughter lives with her. Um, she could agree with her daughter to not actually pay the daughter the share of cost, right? She could say, okay, you you can, would it be okay with you to just get paid from in-home supportive services at 2,100 and I won't pay you the share of cost. And that's, that's a way to work it with families because Jill's daughter was doing this anyway, right? She's taking care of her mom anyway. She wasn't getting paid. Now mom applies for Medi-Cal. She has the share of cost, but Jill's at, 
daughter's at least getting something for caring for her mom now. She's getting 2100 She's not getting the full 3300 3, but she's getting part of it. That's another option. A third option is for Jill to meet with a Medi-Cal counselor to remove her share of cost. There are other Medi-Cal programs that don't have a share of cost. It's kind of complicated to figure out which program you're eligible for. So you could contact the Health Consumer Alliance. They're a legal aid um, group or affiliated group, and they work throughout the state of California. So if you call the number there, it's 888-804-3536. If you call them, they can find a counselor in your area to counsel you how to get rid of the share of cost. All their services are free. And the fourth option is to use private caregiver payments to meet the share of costs. This is a little confusing, but I'll, I'll try to give you an example. So with Jill's situation, her share of cost is $1,200 and she only gets $200. IHSS hours a month, but she needs full-time around-the-clock care. So let's say she pays her daughter the $1,200 a month for home care time outside of IHSS care. She can show IHSS, show Medi-Cal that she's met the share of costs by paying the daughter outside of IHSS hours. That would meet the share of cost, and then just uh, Jill's daughter, the provider, would get the full IHSS check. It's one way to meet the share of cost. So there's four different options, either meet the share of cost or get rid of the share of cost. Um, so there are some choices. No, just because you have a Medi-Cal share of cost, don't give up. Try to get rid of it, and hopefully you can figure out a way to do it that makes sense. Yeah, and we have a question related to this slide. Does the provider in the one scenario where, you know, there's an agreement between family members that live together, does the provider have to pay income tax on all of it, even if she does not receive the share of cost? Yeah, I can't answer that question because I'm not um, a tax consultant, but if the provider lives with the consumer, if the daughter lives with Jill, uh, she doesn't have to pay any income tax on IHSS wages. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So here's some resources. Uh, there's a lot, they have a lot of great information. Uh, Canner has a fact sheet. We have a small booklet. Disability Rights has a long self-assessment guide and Justice in Aging work with disability rights to create a guide for advocates that's also very readable for lay people. So there's lots of resources out there to help you with um, ensuring you get the IHSS services you need. Okay, uh, Kim, we also had one more question. Um, if not yet approved for Medi-Cal and IHSS, how does the worker record their hours? Um, you can just keep track of it. And once you're once you're approved for IHSS and Medi-Cal, they'll send timesheets. You can file the timesheets. You may not get as many hours as you worked. It just depends, you know, because you don't know what the hours are going to be yet but you can only get paid for the hours that you actually work during that period that were approved by IHSS. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna talk about home and community-based alternatives, also known as the HCBA waiver. This waiver provides case management, respite, nursing and supportive services, and facility to community transition support services. Um, this waiver is going to be appropriate for um, people with higher needs um, who maybe are unable to stay safely at home on some of the other waivers. They may need to do this waiver in conjunction with, um, with some of the other programs like IHSS, um, which Kim just talked about, or another program that we'll talk about called CCT. But this program is going to give um, probably the most um, services for people who are high needs and need a lot of hours and support to stay at home. Um, so these services can be provided in the home, a congregate living health facility, intermediate care facility uh, for the developmentally disabled, 
you, you must be at risk for nursing facility placement within the next 30 days or be living in an institution for more than 60 days. This program is available statewide um, and the wait list varies. So um, what I would recommend is um, contacting the lead agency when you apply, or if you're in one of the counties um, that doesn't have a lead agency, you'd contact the Department of Healthcare Services. I'll have that information on another slide. But if you wanna know about the wait list I, and, um, and what that would be, I would say it probably would be easier um, as the consumer to call um, the lead agency and find out from them. Um, next slide. How to apply. So it's different depending on what county you reside in. So for Alpine, Imperial, you see these counties here. Um, these participants actually don't have a, a lead agency, so they would need to submit their application directly to the Department of Healthcare Services. I've linked the application here. You would send your application to the Department of Healthcare Services and you would apply that way. Um, for people who are in Orange County or Los Angeles County, um, they would need to look up a waiver agency that uses their zip code specifically. And for all other counties, um, you can go to this link and find the waiver agency. Um, you can find the application online or you can get it through the waiver agency. Next slide. Um, here is um, a listing of the lead organizations that you would use to apply through. Um, this information is also available on the other side in the link if you want to see it bigger um, or if you want to go to the Department of Healthcare Services website. And when, then when you go there, you can click on the waiver agencies and it will give you the information about how to contact them. Next slide. Um, things to consider for the home and community-based alternatives waiver, um, you have to have Medi-Cal to, um, to get access to this program. So you can apply before or after applying for the HCBA waiver. Um, you may run into difficulty if you do not have Medi-Cal and you're trying to apply for the HCBA waiver, but technically you're supposed to be able to apply before or after. Um, so if you have questions about Medi-Cal eligibility to, to access this program, we have fact sheets available, or you can call our office. Spouses can be providers for personal care services. Um, that is something um, that wasn't allowed before, but it is now allowed. And there are some other exceptions where spouses can provide some of the other waiver services. If, for example, in that um, county, there's no other types of providers, exceptions can be made. Um, so the spouses can be paid for those services. Um, it can provide some facility to community transition services. Generally, they're going to try to coordinate with the California Community Transitions Program um, because that pr program has more funds to transition people, but um, the HCBA waiver can provide some transition services and, um, and they'll see what they can do in conjunction with the um, CCT program. The program will likely have you apply for in-home supportive services. Um, and so many people that, that I've uh, worked with accessing this program, either they already had in-home supportive services and maybe it wasn't enough, um, or they're initially applying and they asked them to apply for in-home supportive services, reviewed how many hours they received through in-home supportive services, and then assessed what additional services they need on top of that. And then um, the other thing with most um, home and community-based services programs, it's to be successful, to be able to coordinate all the services, it is really important to have um, family and friends available um, for support. So um, part of what this program includes or, or asks for is, um, who is your circle of support? They try to identify who those people are. So it could be a neighbor, it could be a nonprofit organization, a family member, a friend, but who are the people who are going to be um, part of your circle of support, helping decide what type of care you need, who's gonna be available for backup in the event that your worker um, calls in sick or can't make it. 
Um, and so they, they will be actually a big part of the care planning process and receiving care. Um, and um, if the person does not have a circle of support, then the program identifies, has the participant identified two other, um, two other um, people or two other um, types of agencies or what the alternatives are um, to take the place of the circle of support. So it used to be that if you didn't have three people, they wouldn't let you participate in this program. Um, but now there's more flexibility to try to identify alternatives so that you can still participate in this program because not everybody has um, friends or family member avail available to step in. Um, we have linked here a fact sheet from Disability Rights California that has good information about this program. Um, home and community-based alternatives can be accessed from the community, um, but many times it's very um, helpful from a facility. I've helped somebody who um, they were in a nursing home. They had transitioned from the community. Unfortunately, when they were in the community, um, they didn't, they weren't eligible for Medi-Cal because their income was so high that they um, would have had a large share of cost um, with regular IHSS. Um, so they didn't access those services. He fell, he broke his hip. Um, ended up in the nursing home, but really was unhappy at the nursing home and really wanted to return back home into the community. Um, and so they were able to apply for the home and community-based alternatives waiver because he had been in the facility for over 60 days. Um, he was able to get onto the program. And additionally, um, they were able to qualify for Medi-Cal with spousal impoverishment protections, um, which we talked about in the last um, webinar, the last community webinar that we did. If you have more questions about that, we have fact sheets. You could watch our, our last webinar, um, and I think Maura will actually touch on it a little bit today. But they were able to keep um, all of the spouse's income, and they were able to um, get the services they needed to keep him at home. Um, next slide. Um, really quickly, Pauline, um, just related to this slide, can HCBA be used to supplement the wages of an IHSS worker, or is it used to supplement IHSS? Um, I don't, so I'm not sure how to answer that question. Um, usually, so sometimes, for example, the person's provider is, um, you know, sometimes they're being, a, sometimes they're a provider through IHSS. And if they get additional hours through HCBS and it's the same provider, I suppose that could um, bring them more income. Um, I, I know that's probably not- But not a, add to their hourly wage. Oh, I see what you're saying. I'm actually not sure what they pay for personal care services. Um, I could definitely look into that um, and email email that person back, but I'm not sure what the rates that they pay for personal care services are off the top of my head. It's the same as the county IHSS okay. wages. Okay. Yeah. And they can't supplement it. But you right. can get extra, like you said, Pauline, extra hours so the provider can work more so they can get more hours with the two combined programs, but it doesn't actually increase their hourly wage. Right. Well, thank you, Kim. Yep. Oh, it's over to me again. Okay, so I want to talk about the multi-purpose senior services program. This is another HCBS waiver that's part of Medi-Cal. Um, this program specifically provides case management services to adults 65 and older to help them remain in their own home or their community. Um, so to qualify for this program, you must need skilled nursing facility level care. Uh, and, and it's not, skilled nursing facility level care isn't like as much care as it sounds like. It just means you need help with your activities, some activities of daily living. Um, if you're what people consider frail, you need help maybe with walking or bathing or dressing, you could qualify for the MSSP program. Um, what I really like about this program is there's a social worker that comes to the home that meets with the individual. They check in once a month. It's really support 
to help keep that person in their home because they're vulnerable because of their health. Um, they can provide different services and systems to help keep them in their home, like medic alert um, bracelets, medication dispensers. So the program pays for these things. They can do home assessments and pay for ramps and grab bars to be installed. Um, they can pay for respite care. They can also pay for additional home care on top of IHSS. So MSSP can pay for like someone to come in and help someone bathe uh, once a week. And any services through the MSSP program does not lower IHSS hours. It's not considered an alternative resource for IHSS. There's an agreement between the two programs. So anything you get through the MSSP program is going to be on top of your IHSS hours. Um, to qualify, People can't have a share of cost. You have to have no share of cost Medi-Cal to get into this program. Um, this program is only available in certain counties. So not every county in California has it. And there are enrollment limits in the counties. So some geographic areas will have wait lists for this program. Next slide. So to apply, you have to be eligible for Medi-Cal. You have to make sure your county has a program and there's a link um, in this uh, presentation that we'll send to you um, and you apply. And then they'll send a social worker to the home to evaluate you to make sure you qualify. Um, once you qualify, you can have this program and IHSS services together. If you're in MSSP, you can't be in the HCBA waiver because they're duplicative services. So some of my clients are in MSSP, they get in the wait list or in the queue for HCBA. And once they get into the home and community-based alternatives program, they have to disenroll from MSSP. They can't continue to have it. It's a really great program to help uh, older adults, people over 65 stay in their home with the extra resources they need, do case management that's specialized for the area. These social workers are familiar with the community services available in the area, and their whole point of this program is help keep people out of a nursing home and in their home. So it's more wraparound services than, let's say, a social worker that's affiliated with their um, doctor's office. Next okay. slide. Thank you, Kim. All right, I'm going to now be talking about community-based adult services or CBAS. And we do include the acronyms here. I know a lot of people uh, get flustered when they see acronyms, but it can be important to um, at least know what the acronyms are for different programs if you plan on participating because so many people um, in the social service agencies that help people enroll or that help people kind of um, access these services end up using the acronym. So that's why we do include it. Um, CBAS is a kind of an adult day health program. They provide uh, health, rehabilitation services, personal care. It's, uh, they're, they're center-based programs that are very social in nature. Um, and they provide services to older or disabled adults who want to remain in the community and maintain some personal independence. Um, they can include uh, therapy, which many people um, often you know, are wondering how they can access therapy services as an older adult. Um, they also provide nutrition and hot meals. While they don't provide transportation services in the way that some other programs that we'll discuss uh, do, they do help people get linked up with the transportation services that are available in their county for older adults or people with disabilities, for example, paratransit services. Um, like, you know, similar to the other HCBS programs, you need a skilled nursing level of care. But one of the things that's nice about CBAS is they really look at and consider uh, cognitive disabilities um, differently than some other programs. Um, so for example, some other programs if there's a person with a dementia who's otherwise very healthy, it might be difficult to um, prove uh, the need for, for skilled nursing. But uh, CBAS in particular does provide tailored services to people with cognitive disabilities, um, developmental disabilities, but also including dementia and Alzheimer's. 
It's usually pro uh, provided as a managed care benefit and the eligibility is determined by the managed care plan. So people would contact their managed care plan to get referred to a CBAS program in their area. The nice part about CBAS is that it's available as private pay as well um, to somebody who either isn't eligible for Medi-Cal or has a high share of cost. It's not available in all counties, but there are 270 centers across California. I'll share some information in a moment about how to find out if there's a CBAS program in your area. Some of the things to consider, if someone were to have a high share of costs, but were really interested in CBAS services, it might be more affordable to pay privately. Um, I helped a, a woman in the Bay Area um, we went through kind of Medi-Cal eligibility, what she was looking for for her father. Um, she was, her father was living with her. He started to have, you know, early dementia. She needed some assistance because she wanted to be able to grocery shop, uh, get some things done during the day, um, be able to, um, to, you know, do some cleaning, get some, some different tasks done throughout the, throughout the week, but she had no additional help. When we went through Medi-Cal eligibility, he would have ended up with an ex extremely high share of cost. Um, I think she, we were talking about something in the neighborhood of $3,200. And so uh, the, when we looked at the CBAS program, the one that was closest to her home was roughly $100 a day. So it was a lot more affordable. She decided to enroll him in CBAS three days a week. So on average, she was paying $1,200 a month for CBAS versus you know, a $3,200 or $4,000 share of cost. Um, as I mentioned, it's one of the few programs that you know, considers dementia diagnosis as a factor in the needs assessment. Um, many of the CBAS programs provide really specific services based on the community that they serve. So we encourage people to contact the CBAS program uh, closest to them, ask questions, visit, particularly if the older adult or person with a disability um, speaks a different language. And, you know, it would be nice to have staff that can communicate in that language. One of the things to also consider is that CBAS programs are part-time. Sometimes they're only available from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. or it might be limited days. And so may need to consider um, layering CBAS with other services. So for example, someone could be participating in IHSS services as well as CBAS. But um, if that were the case, may need to consider that your IHSS hours could be reduced if you participated in CBAS um, because you know, you're out of the home during that time someone else is providing the caregiving services. <clears throat> Sorry, I am having trouble switching my slides. Um, I don't know why I can't. Um, hmm. I might need to exit out of this. Uh oh. Hmm. Well, try exiting out, and if not, I could um, be sure if it still doesn't work. In the meantime, um, Kim is going to sing a tune. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. This would be the time that um, my computer decides to to completely shut down. You don't want to hear me sing a tune. Or tell a joke. Back to that. <laughs> I think it might be some kind of. Micah, a... do any tricks? <laughs> yeah, I didn't bring him to the office with me today. He likes to sing. He could sing. Um, My dogs are camera shy. Okay. Pauline, would you be able to share the presentation? I think I might be having some kind of an action problem. You know, Mara's working through a big storm in LA and a school strike. So um, yeah, we have certain challenges down here in LA right now. <laughs> yeah, this wasn't part of the bargain when I moved to LA, <laughs> this weather. Oh, I think it was a, I think I'm back stable again. Um, let okay. me. If not, I've just downloaded the slides okay. or I could just share it from um, Google slides, right? Yeah, but I think I'm back okay. uh, again, so. Okay, Oof. are we, 
back in business yep. Yep. on a completely different slide than I was on. All right. Yes. Good. Um, Great. Keep things interesting. I hope you're all awake now. Okay. Um, so to locate a CBAS program in your area, I've provided the link here, but I also took a snapshot of the map. As you can see, a lot of particularly rural areas do not have a CBAS program, unfortunately. And then um, some of, you know, Los Angeles has a, a lot. Some of in the Bay Area, there's a very high concentration in Northern California. Again, um, people should contact their managed care plan for a referral to a specific CBAS center, but it's okay to call CBAS programs, ask some questions, um, see if it's the right fit for you know, your loved one or, or yourself. Okay. And now I'll turn it over to Kim, who will hopefully have less of a crazy presentation than mine. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna talk about the program for all inclusive care for the elderly. So these names, this is why we use the acronyms because the names are so long and so awkward that often we don't even know what the name is. We only know it by the acronym. And that's why Mara gave you the acronym because that's what people refer it to. Um, so the PACE program is, it's kind of like, and now for something completely different, right? A PACE program is a total wraparound program that provides all healthcare and community-based services in one one-stop shop. Okay, the model was created in San Francisco to serve the Chinese population, the Chinese community in San Francisco a few decades ago and was very, very well received. Um, and it's a wonderful model for people who it fits. So there's only, I think it's certain types of people that like this program. Um, to join a PACE program, you have to assign your Medi-Cal and Medicare to PACE. So it's like an HMO in that way. So you have to change all your care to your local PACE program. And when you join PACE, it provides all your health care. Um, usually there's a day center like CBAS, adult day health care center where you can go to spend the day there. They will have all the doctors there at that facility or nearby and provide transportation. They'll have social workers there. They'll have dentists there. They'll have podiatrists there. They'll have everything there that you need at uh, this PACE center. You'll get meals there. And they also provide home care. So when you're not at the PACE center, they provide home care through a home health agency. So if someone's in PACE, they do not get in-home supportive services, but they do get the home care through PACE, which is easier for some people to manage because the IHSS program, you have to find your own provider. If your provider doesn't show up, you have to try to find someone else to cover or you're left without a provider. In the PACE program, it all goes through the PACE system and they use agencies so there's somebody available for you. Also for people that have trouble managing an IHSS provider, PACE may be a good option for them. Um, let's see. You have to need skilled nursing facility level care like these other programs to enroll. And again, that just means help with your activities of daily living. Um, it's also available to non-Medi-Cal or non-Medicare participants as a private pay, but can be expensive. I didn't know this, but it's on the slide. I don't know how much it would cost. Um, I'm guessing kind of like an assisted living, like they have a set rate. I also know PACE programs sometimes will work with you if you have a share of cost. Um, so if you do have Medi-Cal with a share of cost and you wanna enroll in PACE, you can talk to them about, is there ways to meet the share of cost or would they waive it? Um, it's only available in certain geographic areas. Is that on the next slide? Yeah, it's only available in certain geographic areas. Like in LA County, we have different PACE providers, but if you live in LA County, they may not cover you. It just depends exactly on where you live. They have catchment areas. And because of the transportation model, they will only trans people so far to their centers. Um, but you do have to give up your current managed care plan unless the pace, your current providers are somehow overlapping with the plan. PACE is usually really open to having you come visit the center, talk to them, see if you like it before you enroll. So if you're interested in PACE 
and you live in a home or in the community that's covered by PACE, contact them and go see their center and talk to somebody there. Um, a lot of times PACE will let you hang out for the day and sometimes CBAS programs too, they'll let you hang out for the day, see if you like it before you actually enroll in the programs. Um, yeah, that's it. I was gonna comment, um, you know, I did hear from somebody who had um, Medicare only um, and when they called to find out how much it would cost through PACE, I believe it was like $5,000 a month. So it can be pretty, even though we say it can be done, it would be pretty costly if you didn't have Medi-Cal. Yeah. I was also going to chime in that um, PACE, uh, it can be a nice fit for people who are having trouble finding an IHSS worker um, because PACE contracts their own workers and manages kind of that employment piece, manages the time cards. Or um, I spoke to an older gentleman who, you know, he didn't have anybody to help him figure out time cards or how to interview an, an in-home worker. It just seemed really overwhelming to him. So, you know, we discussed PACE as a nice alternative. Yeah. Thank okay. you. All right. Now on to the ALW. The easiest of all the, the, the least complicated of all the HCBS programs? Just kidding. I don't know if I would say that, um, but um, one thing I will mention just, just to make it sound more complicated is um, the Department of Healthcare Services is currently working on integrating the assisted living waiver um, with the home and community-based alternatives waiver. And so we don't know exactly what that's going to look like, um, but you know when we do know more, we will um, provide updates um, about that. But the target date for approval of of the amendment and integration of the waiver would be um, around February 2024. So we may see changes. We may see some positive changes. Um, currently the assisted living waiver is limited, um, to the counties that I have listed here. Um, so potentially it could expand, um, the program statewide. Um, it should expand it statewide, but how that will be done, um, how quickly that will be done, all those things are still up in the air. Um, so there could be, um, it, major improvements, um, or there could be more confusion. We will see, um. The assisted living waiver program is available to people 21 and older um, with a choice of residing in an assisted living or public subsidized housing. With that being said, there's only um, LA County that offers the public sub subsidized housing currently, and it's only um, one uh, home care agency that's providing that. So it's not really um, widely available, um, even though it says it is. Um, but maybe with the integration of the waiver, it will be more in the future. That's a possibility. So Medi-Cal um, pays for the additional services that they, the person needs to remain in the community at the assisted living facility, but the participant still has to pay um, for the room and board. So um, the participant would pay um, the certain amount, um, $1,324.82 and 82 cents directly to the facility and Medi-Cal would pay the facility or if the facility contracts um, with a provider to provide the additional services, Medi-Cal would pay for those additional skilled services. Um, one of the major restrictions for the program is that you have to be eligible for Medi-Cal with no share of cost. Um, and you have to be at risk for placement in a skilled nursing facility. So when you, um, when you contact the care coordination agency, they would do the assessment and determine if you're um, eligible um, based on your, your um, medical needs. And then as far as share of cost, um, you have to be eligible with no share of cost. The income um, that you can have varies a little bit because the amount that you pay towards the facility counts as a deduction. So if you do have a share of cost, and your income is between $1,677 to $2,200, there may be a way to eliminate your share of cost. If you have questions about that, I would recommend that you call our office and we can walk you through that. 
um, because then um, the assisted living waiver could be an option for you. For some people, um, they've been told that they can't qualify because they have a share of cost, but there may be a way to, um, to eliminate the share of cost and be eligible for the program as long as they also meet the clinical criteria. Um, next slide. The application process. Um, you must be enrolled in Medi-Cal with no share of cost. You want to contact the local care coordination agency. So there's a list of agencies um, that serve various counties. Um, there's duplicate agency or there's agencies that serve, um, or how can I say this? There's many um, in one county, there can be many agencies that serve that same county. So in, in some counties, you have many options about what um, care coordination agency that you can go with. Um, and so you would want to pick one. They will assist you in completing the application and assessment process. The care coordination agency will contact you when a slot is available, and the care coordination agency will place you in a participating facility. Um, so um, next slide. So um, something that's important to note is that um, is that if you are on the wait list for the assisted living waiver and you're admitted to a hospital or a skilled nursing facility, you can be prioritized and um, and get on to you can get off the wait list faster if you're on the wait list or you can get into the program faster. So you wanna let your care coordination agency know if you already were on the wait list and now you're in a facility. Um, the other thing um, some people have done, which I really um, caution that you um, proceed with care is um, in some cases, if there is an APS case open, um, where the person is in danger of, of being homeless or um, they that can also um, expedite your slot on the wait list. But I would really caution against that. Um, getting APS involved, that would be adult protective services, unless that really is a risk. I have heard from people doing it more as a strategy. And, um, and you know, you really want to caution about getting a, adult protective services involved if there really isn't um, an emergency. Um, you want to choose your care coordination agency with care. Um, they will continue to coordinate your care beyond placement. Um, the other thing we've noticed, you know, depending on which care coordination agency you contact, um, your availability to get on the program sooner may vary. So some um, agencies may have slots available and um, some agencies may not. So when you call the care coordination agency, you may want to ask them what the wait list looks like, how, um, how likely is it that you would get a slot anytime soon, how long the wait would be. And so you want to get that information from the care coordination agency. Um, so you might want to call a few before you actually commit to one. You can switch with your care, your care coordination agency at any time. We have talked to people who... Um, who encountered problems with the care coordination agency. Maybe they weren't responsive. Maybe they weren't giving them updates about where there's, um, you know, where, where they were on the wait list, how soon they would get a slot, um, or maybe they were told they'd get a slot at a certain time and did not. Um, so you can switch your care coordination agency, um, but that's who you're gonna need to go through to apply. We want you to, to um, be aware that any facility um, who is enrolled in the program but is offering to accept um, accept you before being placed by a CCA or offering to help you get on the assisted living waiver program, they don't have the authority to do that. You can only get on the program through the care coordination agency. So what we've seen a lot happen is um, somebody may um, be told by the facility, oh, you don't need to listen to the care coordination agency. I have a, a spot, a bed for you. You can come here. And then when you get approved, um, don't worry, you'll have your slot already. Um, and then what happens is the person may wait years on the wait list, or maybe when their slot comes up, the facility says, actually, I no longer wish to participate in this program, or I don't, I don't have 
um, I don't want to have a bed available for the for the program. And actually, that person is not protected. So we'd really um, advise you to make sure you're following the guidance of the care coordination agency, not the facility. Um, you will be placed in the facility by the care coordination agency. And um, and so that you should go that route. So that's something to really consider. Um, I'm trying to think. I, I think that's it. We'll see if anyone has any other questions about that. Um, but we see a lot of issues come up. And, um, and so that's one of the things you want to make sure that you're um, going through the care coordination agency. Um, next slide. Okay. I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, the final program on our list for today, which is the California Community Transitions Program, or CCT. Um, this program provides transition support uh, for people who are currently residing in a facility with transition back to the community. So in order to qualify, participants, as with everything else here, do have to be Medi-Cal eligible but they also must be currently in a hospital or skilled nursing home for more than 60 days. Um, the program offers a lot of support and then actual concrete items, um, support with purchasing and supplying durable medical equipment. So they can do things like uh, home and vehicle adaptations, uh, home setup, uh, providing assisted devices, um, wheelchairs, medical beds, other equipment. They can provide um, training to family members to provide, you know, the care that someone needs once they go home. They can provide nurse visits. Um, and then they provide support with enrolling in other programs that the person would need to maintain their independence, both um, some of the HCBS programs that we discussed today, or also um, we've known them to help with uh, act, help people access income maintenance benefits that will help them maintain, you know, their independence as well. Um, they can help with the transition back to an existing home, or people can receive help with finding and setting up a new home. And this can include uh, support with actual cash for the, um, the deposit on a new apartment, for example. It is available in most counties. It's supposed to be available statewide, um, but similar to some of the other programs we discussed today, in order to access the CCT program, you have to go through uh, a coordinating agency in your county. And currently there are 11 counties that do not have a coordinating agency. So that is something that we're trying to work on and advocate for to make sure that residents in those counties have access to this service, um, but currently there is no lead organization. Um, again, must be eligible for Medi-Cal to apply for CCT and the residency, you know, the person must physically be in the facility. And while they're awaiting approval, they need to actually get confirmation of approval. They should not leave. So for example, someone wouldn't want to uh, submit a request or application for CCT services and then go home. Um, the person has to actually be in the facility still at the point when they're approved uh, for CCT participation. People need to apply through their local lead organization. I've included the link here and it's uh, split up by county. The lead organization will contact the facility, either the hospital or skilled nursing home to do an assessment um, to get medical records. They do an extensive interview. I actually recently helped um, a family friend apply for CCT um, and was on the phone with them. It's not something that uh, we would normally do. This was a, a friend of our family, but it was about an hour long interview. They really wanted to know every kind of uh, aspect of support that that person would need when they went home, um, including things like how, what kind of transportation will you use? How will you get to the store? Do you, will you need help getting groceries? Um, how, what kind of utensils will you use to eat food? So it was very detailed, but with the goal of ensuring that that person has everything they need when they get home to be successful in maintaining their independence. Um, it can be very helpful for someone who has lived in a nursing home for um, and wants to leave, but needs help with putting services in place so that they can live in the community. Um, for example, there was uh, an individual 
2021 that one of our staff assisted with linking to CCT. The CCT lead organization helped this person apply for SSDI income so that she would have income. They helped her apply for a housing subsidy so that she could get low income housing. Then they also helped her with applying for in-home supportive services so that she would have the ongoing in-home care that she needed. She was able to move into her own apartment and live independently. And this was someone who had been in a facility, a younger person actually, who had been in a facility for several years. Um, the, as I mentioned that, you know, that application and assessment process timeline, it's very, very important that someone is still in the facility while that process is completed and it can be lengthy. Um, it can take 30 to 60 days, so it may not work for, for everyone, uh, particularly people who want to go home in a very short period of time. For the family member that, or family friend that I mentioned, um, he really wanted to go home. I, you know, wanted to help him and his wife access the CCT program because his wife was 80 years old. She was not going to be able to help him. He needed a medical bed and a Hoyer lift but he so anxiously wanted to leave that he left before the CCT application was approved. He just, um, and I, I definitely understand it. Um, he did no longer wanted to be in the facility, wanted to get home, but unfortunately he missed the opportunity um, to receive the CCT benefit because he left before his application was approved. One of the nice things about CCT is that it will provide case management services for one year from when the person moves out of the facility. Um, and that's really helpful because it's not just getting you out, getting you into an apartment and good luck, you're on your own. It really is the goal of the programs is to ensure that people have uh, are linked to the long-term services that they need to maintain their independence, um, including income and in-home care. Okay, so um, we wanted to give you a slide here that just provides an overview kind of reminder about the programs that support transition out of skilled nursing facilities or hospitals. So that includes CCT, HCBA, the ALW program and IHSS. So um, one thing that would be, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> programs that help people stay at home, IHSS, uh, the PACE program, MSSP, CBAS, and HCBA. So um, the Home and Community-Based Alternatives Waiver was discussed. Um, you know, we talked about, uh, Pauline talked about how people can apply from a facility, but people can also apply for that program from the community if they're at imminent risk of entering a nursing home without the services that they need. So we have links to the DHCS information pages on all of these programs. Um, we don't have time today for an extensive overview of spousal impoverishment, but want to mention that there are special rules for married couples and registered domestic partners, which can be accessed through participation in an HCBS program. So if there is a couple married or registered domestic partners or one person is high need and uh, could benefit from an HCBS program, they could access these protections that let um, them have additional, keep additional income, um, which can often remove or reduce a share of costs by rebalancing the couple's income. And it gives them additional um, asset protection as well. We have a fact sheet on how spousal impoverishment works with HCBS that's linked here for more information. I'm briefly just gonna um, cover Medi-Cal recovery because uh, for anyone that is familiar with Medi-Cal recovery, it's most often talked about in relation to nursing homes, but it's important to, um, to acknowledge that there are some HCBS programs that could uh, create a Medi-Cal recovery issue. So briefly, what is Medi-Cal recovery? If someone was 55 or older and used skilled nursing services or certain home and community-based services, the state may try to seek reimbursement for services that were provided. Recovery doesn't happen during a beneficiary's lifetime, it's only after their death. And there's a lot of instances in which recovery does not happen. There's no recovery if there's nothing left in the estate of that person or in their name, the person who received Medi-Cal when they pass away. There's no recovery if the assets are protected by estate planning, and that can include living trust, joint tenancy, payable on death accounts or life estates. 
There's no recovery if there's a mobile home or if there's a surviving spouse, registered domestic partner, or disabled child. Uh, Medi-Cal recovery is its own training in itself, so we, we wanted to just mention it today, and, but we do have a link to our guide on Medi-Cal recovery. It's a consumer guide, and it gives you all the details um, so that people can be prepared. So which programs um, would be counted under Medi-Cal recovery? Um, it's very important to know that IHSS, which is one of the you know, most popular of our most widely used of the home and community-based services program, it does not create Medi-Cal recovery. Um, the three programs that do are the Assisted Living Waiver Program, the Multipurpose Senior Services Program, or MSSP, and the Home and Community-Based Alternatives, or HCBA program. So if a Medi-Cal beneficiary, an older adult, uh, used Medi-Cal, you know, they were 80 years old, they lived at home, they only received IHSS, regardless of what estate planning issues happened or whether there was a surviving spouse, we know that there could not be any Medi-Cal recovery because the services that they used would not create Medi-Cal recovery. So this is, again, very brief, just meant to kind of um, put a, a red flag out there, a note for people who are thinking about participating in services. Okay, so we definitely want to have time for some questions, um, and thank you for your time and attention today. Um, we have a lot of information on our website at canner.org. We also take uh, calls through our 1-800 number, and we have a form that people can fill out, and we can respond to you by email or set up a time to talk. But for now, I will stop sharing my screen, and we'll take some questions. Um, Pauline, did you have? Um... Yeah, there, there were a couple here. Um, let's see. Um, there was one about um, the assisted living waiver program. It was more of a comment. Um, they have had problems with agencies not wanting to process applications if the individual is not currently in one of the participating counties, even if they live in a participating county but are in a hospital or SNF in a neighboring non-participating county. Um, so definitely we encounter lots of different types of issues um, with the programs um, and it, they always vary by county. So it is um, good for us to hear about them. And if you do encounter these problems, um, you're welcome to contact us, um, especially if, if you have um, the client's permission and we can help you try to sort through it um, with the um, with the state. Um, I think that would be the best way to address it because they should be um, allowing that, but it's really just going to depend what what their reason is and um, and how we can help intervene. Um, another question somebody had: Would an individual stay on the CCT program after being home from the SNF for a while? or would they then have to transition to MSSP and IHSS? Um, so CCT will provide services for up to a year, but that is the goal of CCT is during that year to help that person get linked with services like MSSP or IHSS. So, you know, at least initially, every lead organization probably has a more detailed timeline of what their goals look like. Um, so they would probably be starting out at the beginning, the way it was explained to me, much more kind of intensive. And then the goal being that they're transitioning over the course of that year to other supportive services. So yes, they would be on CCT for a year, but during that time, other services would start and kind of take the place of the CCT and gradually CCT would kind of taper off and then end their case management at the end of one year. Okay, and the next question is, does a CCT program also assist with the assisted living waiver program if housing cannot be found for a patient? Um, that is my understanding that they, CCT agencies are very aware of all of the home and community-based service program options and help people apply. So one reason why I think CCT can be, uh, or one kind of population that I think can be, um, can find particular use in the CCT program 
are residents of facilities who don't have very involved family members or friends who don't have a circle of support, who need a lot of help kind of filling out applications, navigating these different systems. So yes, um, they, they can help them apply. I would say for the ALW program, um, there wouldn't maybe need, be the need to jump through a hoop of going to CCT to get onto ALW though, because the ALW care coordination agencies often will help people do the same thing. If they're, if really the only goal is to get into the ALW program, then the care coordination agencies can be incredibly helpful with, with making sure that nursing home residents receive the support they need to go through that application process. Yeah, I suppose the only time maybe is um, if they're saying, if maybe they contact the care coordination agency for the assisted living waiver and they say, well, the wait list for you would be six months or a year and maybe um, CCT could transition them, you know, to an apartment temporarily with services until they can, you know, um, get onto the assisted living waiver program. But I mean, I don't, I don't hear of that happening very often, but I suppose it could. Um, next question, does assisted living waiver cover room and board plus skilled care if a patient is unable to afford to pay for room and board? Uh, yeah, Good. sorry. Um, so unfortunately, um, it is a rule that um, Medi-Cal cannot pay for room and board. So um, the person would need to be able to pay um, the room and board, which is um, the uh, rate that I mentioned before. Um, and so they would need to pay that amount. Um, and then Medi-Cal would pay for the additional skilled services. So yeah, unfortunately, if someone has outside bills, um, for example, a mortgage or, um, you know, utilities, things like that, they, they may not be able to continue to cover those outside bills because they would need to pay um, the board, um, the room and board to participate in the program. Um, how do I find an IHSS caregiver? Um, well, each county has a public authority that should have a registry of caregivers. Um, so you can contact a public authority for your county. Their registry, the caregivers will be pre-screened, meaning they've already been uh, fingerprinted, background checked, and done the one-hour training. So that's one good way to find a caregiver. Um, your neighbors, friends, if you belong to a religious institution, uh, community colleges, nursing programs, reaching out to them um, are all different ways to find caregivers, but it can be very challenging to find a caregiver right now. There really is a provider shortage. Um, so someone put in personal assistance services council link that's in Los Angeles County. They have a registry in LA County, but um, each county. And also I didn't mention IHSS also has a backup provider system um, that should be statewide by now. So if you're in IHSS and your provider didn't show up, you should be able to get a backup provider through the backup provider system. You should contact your local either public authority or IHSS department to find out about backup providers. Thanks. Okay, next question. Can you be too high needs or disabled for home and community-based services? No. No. <laughs> I've had clients very high level care in a coma, G-tube fed, and they're at home in a hospital bed using HCBS services and very well cared for. But generally, you, you do need family support if you're that high care. It's very challenging to do it without family support. Not impossible, but very, very challenging. Right. Next question. If someone is in an assisted living facility and their funds are spending down, can you apply for both Medi-Cal and ALW at the same time, as is recommended with IHSS? Would ALW go retroactive? Um. No, ALW is not retroactive, um, unfortunately. Um, that's that's not 
um, you have to get a slot that's approved and there's an approval date. And then um, even again, I think Pauline kind of addressed this, the fact that someone is living in an assisted living facility, even if that assisted living facility is an ALW participating facility, and most of them are not, there's, there's a very short provider list that doesn't guarantee that the when someone is approved for the ALW, that the facility will accept them on the ALW program at that facility. So no, we, we generally, you know, you really want to be upfront with people that if they're in a, an assisted living facility, even if that facility is, you know, has some ALW residents, the person may not be approved for a slot at that particular facility. They may need to move. Um, if they're spending down their funds, we do, um, you know, now the asset limits have increased in 2024. There will no longer be an asset limit. Uh, so as long as an individual, a single person is under $130,000 in countable assets, they should definitely apply for Medi-Cal, even if they can't, you know, maybe meet their share of costs right now, or they don't plan on, um, you know, utilizing the benefits, they could definitely apply and kind of investigate and look at whether um, getting on an ALW waitlist works for them. Um, but no, it would not be retroactive. And my understanding is that you must have a Medi-Cal, um, have approved Medi-Cal eligibility before you can even get on the wait list for the ALW program. So, yeah, I mean, there could be somebody who could be really lucky, right? They could be in a facility that happens to participate and then they can apply for the ALW, get on the wait list. And maybe they're so lucky that right at the time they run out of money, um, this they get a slot and that facility agrees to accept them. It's possible, um, but everything would have to align perfectly. And um, in my experience, that doesn't always happen, but it could um, once in a while. Um, if a person receives hospice services, are there any changes to any of the services? Will applications be expedited? It's a very broad question. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure how to answer because I'm reading into the question and guessing what you're kind of asking. <laughs> but um, in general, um, people are not expedited. In, you know, for example, for, for many of these programs, people can be prioritized for the ALW program based on whether they're in a hospital or a skilled nursing facility, or um, if they have an open APS case, for example, adult protective services case. But no, um, we often get calls from people where they are desperate to access services. And unfortunately, um, Medi-Cal, you know, neither Medi-Cal nor um, the HCBS programs will kind of speed up um, the process based on your circumstances, because likely there are hundreds of other people that are in similar circumstances across the state, thousands perhaps. So um, no. But you can have hospice, be on hospice and enroll in any of these programs if you meet the criteria. So it won't exclude you from the programs. Yeah. Okay, well, we have come to 1130. Um, thank you all so much for your wonderful questions. Um, they were really helpful to, to make sure that we didn't miss anything. Um, we thank, uh, wanna thank Kim Selfon from Betzetic for her time for joining us today. Um, and thank you all for joining us. And we hope that you can come back for additional presentations in the future.